As far as the eye can see, there are hills carpeted with wild grass. And yet, we are in Greenland. This August in the south of the territory, it's haying time for these farmers. This grass will feed their ewes this winter. It's so hot, I use the air condition a lot. When we are buying the tractors from Denmark, we used to say it has to be have uh, air condition. And they say, why? Why do you need it in Greenland? It's so cold down there. <laughs> but they had to try. As a result of climate change, this summer it's eight degrees warmer than the seasonal average. And it hasn't rained for two months. This summer it's always sunny. You can see some places it's too dry. So if it was a little bit rainier, so it could be a little bit higher, I think. But it's good for me to now. In this village of 80 inhabitants, almost everyone is involved in farming. It's a legacy from the Viking era, for it was here in Kasia Zuk that Eric the Red and his son, Leif Eriksson, lived. In the 10th century, these conquerors from Iceland gave this island its verdant name, Greenland. My father took it from his father, and I took it from my father. And I like it. I don't get many money off it, but it's the nature, and I like it here. Greenland currently has 37 animal farms, all located here in the south of the island, near the ice cap. Over the last 40 years, the Arctic has warmed four times faster than the rest of the planet. The impact of climate change on agriculture is minimal. However, the subsoil has become more accessible. And it's one of the richest subsoils in the world. Uranium, rare earths, gold. Greenland could become an El Dorado for mining companies. Everything is decided in Nuuk, the capital. This Danish civil servant assists Greenland's Minister of Natural Resources. Actually, this is the south of Greenland, and this is the area where we have the most interest from exploration companies. The red spot is, is areas where they are applying. The blue, blue spots are where there is an active exploration. And we have some yellow dots, and that is where there are exploitation. Greenland is still part of Denmark, but it has its own parliament. And since 2009, Greenlanders have had sole responsibility for deciding the future of their subsoil. And it has been a process where Greenland is, is uh, taking over responsibilities um, going along. There are some areas that are still left in, in Denmark. It's foreign policy. It is um, the court system and its police, for example. There are also other areas that are not home taken yet. That cost money. And Denmark still pays the territory 450 million euros every year, half of Greenland's annual budget. The money from the mines would allow the inhabitants financial independence. At least that's what the local government thinks, as it tries to attract foreign investors with a series of promotional films. Greenland has been an excellent place to work. I've worked in over 30 countries, and Greenland is an excellent jurisdiction to invest. The political climate is stable, and it's an honest government. There's no corruption. They have the most interesting assets you can find anywhere in the world. It has a lot of public support for mining. You can apply online, and you will very soon have your exploration license. The investor we need to understand that once all of these deposits will be developed, Greenland is the place to go to. The ecologists who were elected to lead Greenland's government in 2021 are calling for rational management of resources. Greenlanders are very keen to make sure that nothing happens to the nature around them because we live from the nature. 
We live from fishery and hunting and all that kind of stuff. So, so it's very, very important that these rules and regulations are in place and that we can follow up and monitor and supervise and all that kind of stuff uh, when things are happening. Back to the south of the country. Here in Narsak, the inhabitants are opposed to the mines. Just eight kilometers from their homes, this mountain is full of uranium and is attracting a lot of interest. An Australian company wants to turn it into an open cast mine. However, this Green MP succeeded in having the project suspended. We cannot sit here and risk that uh, some areas in, in the whole Greenland will be polluted uh, with some radioactive where you cannot uh, use the land uh, to anything else, according to the other countries. Uh, experiences. But although Marianne Paviensen has succeeded in having the project frozen, the Australian company is not giving up. It is counting on the next elections in two years' time to change the situation. The fight is uh, unfortunately not over yet. Some people are, are saying that we have to open the Gwennerswit uh, mining project to get independence. But which kind of uh, dependence do you really want mining companies or the Danish government, which we can work. For some, the opening of this mine is seen as a threat. But for this village, which has been hard hit by unemployment, it is also an opportunity. The foreign company promises to create a thousand jobs and to pay 200 million euros in annual tax to the region. The mining company have been told, telling us that the mine will only go on in 37 years. We don't need uh, jobs who c only can last in 37 years. We need jobs who can last 100 years, like sheep farming has going on. If you go to the grocery shops, you can see that almost everything is imported from Denmark. So if we really want to be independence the way for me is to process more food here in our country. On the neighboring shore, some people are trying their hand at developing a local economy. Paul is a chef. He and other chefs in the region have created a new 100% Greenlandic cuisine. This is Angelica. I like to pick a lot of them, and you can as well make some jam out of it. As a kid, we used to just dip it with sugar and eat it like this. It tastes like celery. Those are small angelica. I can use for like sweet dishes. South Greenland is like the paradise of wild herbs. Longer, warmer summers encourage the emergence of plants that thrive year after year. I would love to make the Greenlandic cuisine the traditional way, but with the twists of a new modern kitchen. Paul works as a chef at this inn during the summer. On the menu today is a reinvented fish dish. The most of the farmers that grow their own vegetables take it to their own, but not selling it. Most of this sell is potatoes. This is my take on, on a smoked salmon. We got some aioli, red pickled onion, net, and elk dasset. Everything is from Greenland. The owner of the inn also raises sheep. This Inuit woman is banking her economic future on agriculture and tourism. With her husband, she is fighting against the opening up of mining projects. Some people even told us, um, as soon as the mining company opens, we will not buy your meat from your lamb. And that was really hard because then you already feel like you're getting, you're losing 
the fight is not done yet. It's still there. And it's uncomfortable because you still have a little bit of feeling. Okay, do I buy this new tractor? Can I invest more? Can I build something on my farm? Can we build something here and we will be fine? I have no plans on moving. I think I will get very old here and die. <laughs> and I'm happy to because I think I can do a lot here. Next door is Kulk, a young farmer who used to live in Denmark. He chose to return to the land and will soon be looking after 600 ewes. I came back in 2020 and uh, started working with my father in the farm. My father has it maybe from 70s. Young people like him who come back to take over the farms are few and far between, as the cost of living and the isolation are just some of the factors that keep them away from the fields. Here, everything has to be imported. Kolok is receiving the furniture for his daughter's bedroom today. We have to order online and uh, ship. And if we sh use the ship, it's cheaper. If it's airplane, it's really expensive. We have to be patient. It takes a lot of time to arrive. We have ship arriving every 14 days with uh, fresh supplies, like fruits or potatoes. The few fruits and vegetables available have all passed through Denmark, even the potatoes that could be grown in Greenland. The farmers, we usually focus on the sheep, so we don't have so much time, but you can easily grow if you have time, so maybe some others can do that. We have some uh, products from uh, slaughterhouse produced, sort of uh, lamps. They also have, uh, make some pizza from our product. Kuluk's decision to take over the farm made his mother proud. Although the profession has changed over the years with the arrival of machines, she is still passionate about breeding animals. These trophies are um, harvested during in many years uh, of being a farmer. So the best three average lamb per mother sheep, they give them prices. So now we have <laughs> the, the, no, no, no more space for... <laughs> Kuluk's father, who has been a farmer for 30 years, will soon be retiring. He's worried about his son's future. The Narsak mine project at the end of the fjord is also seen as a threat. If the mining starts, it can cause a pollution. The waste will be in, in the lake and make sure it doesn't go away. But the thing is really hard to control it. It can cause it to flood to nature. If the mining starts, uh, I don't know how many wants to buy our product. And we don't understand why the government keep continuing saying that the mining is only the solution to have uh, to bring money to Greenland. We have a lot of other resources we can sell and have as a sustainable business in long term in my opinion. Inhabitants living an hour's boat ride from the village are betting on tourism.
Kakotok, with a population of 3,000, is the largest town in southern Greenland. On the pier, these craftspeople showcase the mineral wealth of the region with these semi-precious stones, which are a unique shade of pink that cannot be found elsewhere. It's dead in the mountains, you know. Right. It's, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I've actually bought silver yeah, and I'm yeah. going to try and custom make them. Yeah, you do nice work. So these buildings, they're like, you know, the, the colonial harbor <laughs> from centuries ago. Like, this building has been a school before and then torn down and rebuilt again. Everybody tried to get a shot from up there through the flowers to the church. Sarah knows the region inside out. Yes, got the shot. <laughs> For many years, she has worked for the Greenlandic company responsible for developing tourism in these fjords. Like the vast majority of Inuit, she dreams of independence, but not at any price. I really think that that's where the tourism industry shines much more than, for example, the mining industry, uh, because it is done in a sustainable way, it's small scale, it's boutique, it's niche. Um, this gives a much better opportunity for the locals to control the narrative and show their own country. But Greenland remains an expensive destination. Those who can afford it are cruise passengers, many of them Americans. During the summer, hundreds of them arrive in the little town every day. But it's a double-edged sword. We are researching how good it is for the economy, actually. Uh, we have a hunch that even though you see big ships and there's lots of people on board, they're actually not leaving that much money in the local economy. A new airport is due to open in 2025. But another difficulty is that the city currently has only one hotel. As for the tour guides, most of them are Danish. Right now, we actually don't have enough people in the Greenlandic tourism industry, so we want to educate more guides. We have a fantastic guide school uh, right here in South Greenland. It's for people all over the country. But here again, the town is faced with an exodus of its inhabitants. To stem the tide, this geologist has a solution, and it's the same one as always. This city used to be twice in size regarding population, but the mining uh, is actually uh, a good way to um, involve people from skilled work workers, but also unskilled, so that this is a good match with the uh, uh, workforce in Greenland. From the heights of Kako Tok, he talks about the potential of the surrounding area. Ole Christiansen is one of the region's leading experts on mineral resources. One of his missions is to advise mining companies looking to exploit these mountains. This is south, and some of the high peaks down in the far distance. Down there we have Nelonak gold mine. I was involved in, in the discovery of that one back in 92. But at the moment the focus is very much on what we call the critical metals that are very much uh, asked for by United States, uh, European Union and many other countries around the world. Here. On this map, he points to a mountain range teeming with rare earths. A foreign company has just obtained a license to exploit it, one of the largest deposits in the world. If you want to try to reduce the greenhouse effects on this globe, you are trying to work around that by doing much more mining. You need to mine much more of these things to be able to produce planes that produce less CO2 and cars. Meanwhile, in Narsak, the company that wanted to mine the uranium has had to rethink its plans. Kvenefjeld will make the world greener. It is also using the ecological argument and, and focusing taxes. its communications the on the presence of rare earths. Electric vehicles and wind turbines can reduce climate change. However, they rely on so-called rare earth metals. Kvenefjeld will make the world greener. But that's not enough to convince the residents, who are overwhelmingly opposed to the project. Aili, a schoolteacher, and Niels, an engineer, belong to an association that has been campaigning for some 20 years against mining. They regularly organize demonstrations, like this one in Nuuk. This is uh, something called neocolonialism. 
So this is a process where um, big companies can come and exploit and also come and very uh, much affect people. Uh, they have been um, sponsoring our local soccer teams. They are part of the posters and the sports halls. What if the future lay in food self-sufficiency? This is another avenue being explored by the ecologist government. Along the fjord close to the village, another slower but more sustainable development model is being tested. This Danish market gardener has been working for the Greenlanders for two years. On his farm, he is testing large-scale vegetable cultivation. His aim is to pass on his expertise to local farmers. Here yeah, testing uh, broccoli. I think it's very easy to grow them here. In the other countries, you use a lot of pesticides to make broccoli. And you see no worms here at all, or insect. So it's very good. When I grow salad in Denmark, you have a big problem with uh, a sickness called Baimia. It's a fungus who go on the lowest leaf here. But now it's number two season. I have not seen it here at all. Yeah, last, you can grow two times salad on the same land here without problem. If you want to grow vegetables, it's good. Yeah, yeah, one way and all. <laughs> and in this greenhouse, Kim goes even further by trying his hand at growing strawberries. In just a few weeks, these plants have covered the space, a feat never before seen on this scale. There's no heating here inside. Here they have heating. Kim grows tomatoes, basil, and even peppers here. I make this, this was mostly for private use, but uh, people wanted to buy them, so I have, I think I have five or six in the beginning, but now I have two left, because people come and buy them instead. New flavors to whet the appetite of the whole region. These two men are in charge of purchasing for the major supermarkets in Greenland. They're here today to look at the broccoli. First time I saw. Yeah. Here in Greenland? Yeah. Next year you see big fields all over. <laughs> <laughs> There's a market, a big market. It's better for us to take it up here and it's take it from Denmark or from Spain or we get vegetable from. It's, it's not, it, we, we throw a lot out and it's not good for the market and the prices up here. We have like six shops, uh, cities where we are in and everybody is, uh, really want to have some vegetables from the south right now. If the farmers can meet some more, we will buy it. <laughs> I can see in my Facebook sites, every time I put something on Facebook, people come over here. So uh, if I want to have a reaction day, don't put anything on Facebook. While climate change offers new opportunities here, the region will need to invest in new infrastructure. Will its future lie in strictly regulated mining, coupled with sustainable agriculture? This is the question the 57,000 Greenlanders will have to answer from now on.